I would like to tell you the real story of the Hunt brothers. Unlike everything that you have heard, they were not out to corner the market to make some quick profits. They were out to do what you are probably doing today. The silver bullet and the silver shield is the idea that you should be selling all of your paper assets and buying real physical silver. This physical silver will act as a silver bullet against all the things that are wrong with this world and will act as a silver shield to protect your wealth. Quite simply, what the Hunts were doing was exactly that. They were out to protect their wealth, change the balance of power away from the bankers and politicians that were sliding the country into a collectivist nightmare back in the 70s. The Hunts were very successful and patriotic men that deeply believe that our republic is the best system ever devised on earth and it offers opportunities to all. They despised the Washington and Wall Street establishment that was headed by their arch nemesis, the Rockefellers. The Hunts were also a huge benefactor in the early stages of the Libertarian Party that Ron Paul seems to epitomize today. Bunker Hunt was an enthusiastic proponent of the idea that all currencies should be backed by precious metals like gold and silver. The advantage of remonetization of gold and silver, as the concept is known, the governments cannot casually print money to pay for deficits in their spending unless they have sufficient gold or silver to spend. Since precious metals are in limited supply, remonetization acts as a break to government spending, which they clearly saw with the guns and butter programs of the 1970s. The hunt sought to create a silver cartel, similar to that of OPEC, that would shake the debt-based financial establishment of Washington and Wall Street. Bunker Hunt thought of a way to make this happen by issuing silver-backed bonds that could be redeemed for silver instead of cash. There was even rumors that they wanted the Republic of Texas to create their own silver money in the face of runaway inflation from Washington and Wall Street. Bunker Hunt simply wanted assets that came from the earth that were needed for industry rather than a paper fortune that was steadily depreciating under the weight of dollar bills flowing from the printing presses at the Treasury. They were particularly sensitive to this since their oil contracts were denominated in dollars. During the 1970s, the Hunt brothers were heavy hitters betting one big business deal after another, including oil, real estate, for which they had 5 million acres throughout the world, cattle, sugar, football, and even pizza parlors. Their Libyan oil leases of the late 1960s and early 70s were bringing in $30 million a year in revenues, even when oil was at $3 a barrel. In 1970, when silver was $1.50 an ounce, Bunker Hunt decided to invest there as well. At the time, it was illegal for U.S. citizens to own gold, so silver became the natural second choice. Inflation was starting to gain steam. Vietnam was causing doubts about our government and riots in our country. The Middle East was a powder keg, and Libya, along with their valuable oil field, was in transition. Bunker personally believed that the worldwide situation was going to get worse, and as a result decided to hedge his assets. But with the usual hunt flair for pushing all of his chips out onto the table, it did not take long for a hedge to become a very large position. Herbert Hunt first became interested in silver after reading Silver Profits in the 70s by Jerome Smith. The premise of the book was that the government was clearly following the Keynesian model of economics that would print money to debase the currency and ultimately destroy the dollar. Herbert felt that once the dollar died, the republic would die also. Jerome Smith stated that the decline of the dollar would be the first worldwide runaway inflation and depression in the history of the world. He said, quote, The world monetary system is on a collision course with chaos. The solution is contained in the problem. One can protect oneself from the forces of destruction by converting those resources that are denominated in paper money into hard assets, into real value, preferably into assets whose values are not subject to arbitrary management by anyone, ideally assets that are both hard and highly liquid, into real money like gold and silver. The Hunts also learned that when demand rose for silver, the price would continue to rise, as its price is inelastic. They saw silver as a perfect investment, for it was a silver bullet to the collectivist establishment on Washington and Wall Street, headed by the Rockefellers, and a silver shield to protect their assets as they transitioned. After reading Jerome Smith's book in 1973, Bunker and Herbert Hunt purchased 200,000 ounces of silver, and they saw their silver increase from $1.50 an ounce to $3 an ounce. At the same time, Colonel Gaddafi in Libya shut down British Petroleum and nationalized Bunker Hunt's wells. The major oil companies soon afterwards caved in. The first to break with the major oil companies was Arm & Hammer at Occidental Petroleum, when he gave in to Gaddafi's demands for 51% royalty payment. After Arm & Hammer caved, the other oil companies lined up and gave in as well. The results were an empowerment over major oil companies the Middle East countries had never experienced and that emboldened them to form OPEC and the oil embargo in 1973. Bunker Hunt grew angry at the State Department's lack of support for his lost Libyan oil fields, 
and hired John Connolly to help negotiate with the Libyans without any success. He blamed the big oil companies for using him as a sacrificial lamb in Libya and then hung him out to dry on his own. At the head of the major oil companies were the Hunt's arch enemies, the Rockefellers. Bunker Hunt felt that Washington and New York Eastern Establishment was being led down the road to socialism by the Rockefellers. You know, I think Pat's coming quickly. Soon I think he's going to be in a position for the Trilateral Commission. <laughs> and if he shows promise beyond that, there's Bilderberg. <laughs> World control, Pat. <laughs> Settle for nothing else. With inflation eating at his Libyan profits, and then ultimately no more to come, Bunker started buying silver in a big way with his brother Herbert. In 1973, they started buying. By early 1974, they had accumulated silver contracts totaling 55 million ounces, or about 8% of the world supply of silver at the time. The brothers then took delivery of all 55 million ounces of silver. Bunker was concerned about government confiscation of his silver. He could not bring it to Texas without paying a 5% franchise tax to the state. So the brothers decided to pick up their silver and drop it off into Switzerland for safekeeping. Meanwhile, back at the Circle K Ranch, brother-in-law Randy Creeling and his brother Tillman was holding a shooting contest amongst the cowboys to find the best marksman. The dozen best marksmen were hired for a special assignment to ride shotgun on the world's largest private silver transfers in history. The Circle K Cowboys flew on three specially chartered 707 jets to Chicago and New York, where they were met by a convoy of armored trucks delivering them in the middle of the night 40 million ounces of silver that was loaded onto the planes, and they immediately flew to Zurich, where they were met by another convoy of armored trucks. The Cowboys loaded the trucks and the silver and dispersed it to six different storage locations in Switzerland. The transfer cost for Bunker and Herbert was $200,000. The storage cost for the 40 million ounces in Switzerland and the 15 million ounces still in the United States amounted to $3 million a year. By the spring of 1974, silver rose to $6 an ounce, and rumors were flying around that hunts were trying to corner the silver market. At the time, annual production was about 245 million ounces, and the annual demand was 450 million ounces. The Hunt brothers just took delivery of 55 million ounces. The big question was, how much silver was out in private hands? Of the estimated 700 million ounces of silver, only about 200 million ounces was available for delivery against the futures contracts. That same spring, Bunker appeared on the floor of the Comex in New York for the first time and declared that almost anything is better than paper money and that any fool can run a printing press. The silver market dropped to the 3 and $4 range after that, but Bunker and Herbert just held on and worked other deals. Herbert's real estate deals in North Dallas were paying him handsomely during the 70s, while Bunker's racehorse business did well. Penrod drilling was expanding all over the world and moving quickly to offshore rigs. Hunt Oil's other holdings were increasing in value as the worldwide price of oil escalated. In March of 1975, Bunker Hunt flew to Tehran to meet with the Shah's brother about purchasing silver. Bunker and Herbert still had their 55 million ounces of silver, and the price was walling around $4 an ounce. In spite of the fact that the boys were a little short on cash at the time, Bunker felt that if Herbert could take on a partner to resume the purchasing of silver, the price would rocket upwards. He met with the Iranian finance minister and suggested that the Pahlavi family invest in several million ounces of silver. The finance minister was not familiar with Bunker and asked him how much money he made. Bunker hesitated because as a private individual he was always downplaying his income as much as possible for tax purposes. He finally said somewhere around 50 million dollars a year he was making. Bunker's hesitation put off the minister and, and the deal never went through. Not to be discouraged, Bunker set up a meeting with King Faisal of Saudi Arabia in mid-April. But in late March the king was assassinated by his nephew and the meeting never happened. In the fall of 1976, Bunker and Herbert took delivery of 20 million ounces of silver through a public company they controlled called Great Western United. Great Western was a part of H.L. Hunt's food division that mainly dealt in sugar and sugar futures. The brothers quickly devised a swap where Great Western could trade 20 million ounces of silver to the Philippines for sugar for their refineries. The Philippines would then trade the silver to the Saudis for oil. Herbert flew to the Philippines and worked out the deal with President Marcos, but at the last minute the IMF killed the deal. The IMF would not recognize silver as an asset of the Philippine government and would refuse other loans as a result. The deal fell through, and the brothers sold 20 million ounces of silver in the next year. 
Once again, Bunker felt thwarted by the eastern establishment headed by the Rockefellers. In the spring of 1977, the brothers attempted to take over the largest silver mine in the United States, the Sunshine Silver Mine, through Great Western United. They succeeded in acquiring 28% of the stock with an option to purchase the balance at a later date. They then turned to another commodity play and invested in soybeans. They were a little short on cash, so they used their silver as collateral. As usual, the brothers went into the market a big way. The legal limit for a single investor was 3 million bushels. The brothers brought in other family members and had a total stake of 22 million bushels. The CFTC cried foul and filed suit against the Hunts. The Hunts claimed that other large families did the same thing to get around the 3 million bushel limit, and since they were not part of the Eastern Liberal crowd, they were being unfairly targeted. After the smoke cleared, they still made $40 million profit on their soybean futures. They were fast gaining a reputation for playing fast and loose with the rules concerning the commodities trading. By the late 1970s, the Hunt first family fortune was estimated to be in the range of 6 to $8 billion. In 1978, John Connolly introduced Bunker to a Saudi sheik at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington. A year later, International Metals Investment was incorporated in Bermuda between Bunker, Herbert, and the two Saudi sheiks. It's speculated that the two Saudi sheiks were actually fronting for a member of the Saudi royal family. In early 1979, the price of silver rose steadily for $8, and the Sunshine Mine deal fell apart. The stockholders demanded more money for the balance of the purchase since the mine was now worth more due to the increase in silver. The Hunt's tender offer failed. They sold their interest back to the management trust. In the summer of 1979, the Hunt brothers started buying silver through the International Metals Investment Group, along with their Saudi partners. Over 43 million ounces of silver contracts were purchased through the COMEX and the CBOT, with delivery to be taken that fall. In the fall of 1979, the price of silver doubled from $8 to $16 in only two months. Other syndicates with big money behind them started buying silver. The COMEX and the CBOT started to panic. In 1979, the warehouses of the two exchanges only held 120 million ounces of silver, and that was the amount that was traded in October alone. Many people, including the Hunts, through their International Metal Investment Group, were taking delivery on all their contracts. October 6, 1979, Paul Volcker introduced the first stage of anti-inflationary measures when the Federal Reserve requested that the American banks avoid loans for speculation, especially in commodities. The brothers were starting to fear another confiscation by the United States government, FDR style, since things were coming to a head. Late 1979, the CBOT changed the rules and stated no investor could hold more than 3 million ounces of silver contracts and the margin requirement was to be raised. All contracts over 3 million ounces per trader must be liquidated by February of 1980. Bunker Hunt accused the COMEX and the CBOT board members of having financial interest in the silver market themselves. Investigations later found that many had substantial silver short positions and were hemorrhaging money as Bunker sought to squeeze the market. Bunker knew that a shortage now existed or they would not be screaming so loudly. He bought even more. The price on the last day of 1979 was $34.45. At this point, Bunker and Herbert held 40 million ounces in Switzerland and 90 million ounces of bullion they jointly owned through international metals. In addition to all of that, International Metals had contracts for another 90 million ounces due for March delivery from the COMEX. The younger brother, Lamar, had even entered the arena and, and had taken a $300 million silver position by the end of 1979. Finally, on January 7th of 1980, the COMEX changed the rules to only allow 10 million ounces of contracts per trader and that contracts over that amount must be liquidated before February 18th. The CFTC promptly backed up that ruling. On January 17th, silver hit $50 and Bunker continued to buy. At that point in time, the Hunt silver position was worth over $4.5 billion, bringing their profits into silver at $3.5 billion. On January 21st, the COMEX announced that they were suspending trading of silver, they would only accept liquidation orders, and silver dropped $10 an ounce and stayed around $39 until the end of January. Scrap silver, old silver coins, and silverware came into the market, about 22 million ounces in all. In early February, the Hunt Group took delivery of another 26 million ounces from Chicago. The Hunt's North Sea oil through Placid Oil was coming online, and they would be generating $200 million a year from that venture alone. There was also talk of them taking over Texaco oil. Bunker was also talking with Middle Eastern rulers about putting together another silver buying group. By March 14th, silver was down to $21 an ounce. Paul Volcker had raised interest rates and the dollar had firmed up. This made borrowing to speculate on silver even more expensive. International Metals held 60 million ounces of future contracts. 
Their margin call on those contracts amounted to more than $10 million a day. Bunker still believed that it would go back up if he could only promote more buying. He scrambled around Europe looking for buying partner, but the more the price dropped, the harder it was to borrow money against his silver holdings to buy even more silver to hold the price up. Finally, on March 25th of 1980, the Hunt brothers ran out of cash. Bunker, Hunt, and Herbert simply said, shut it down. 